So now we're going to move on to AV blocks. Whenever we talk about AV blocks, the way you should think about it is it's a effect of the conduction from the atria to the ventricle, and that process is somehow damaged. So when we talk about first degree AV block, what's basically going on is that you have a slowed conduction from the atria to the ventricle. When you move on to second degree AV block, what's actually happening is you have intermittent interruption of that conduction from the atria to the ventricle. And then when you have third degree third degree AV block, you actually have no conduction between the atria and the ventricle and they're beating at their own kind of intrinsic rates. There's a lot of different etiologies that can cause AV blocks, but one of the main ones to kind of be on the lookout for is infarcts because infarcts can actually lead, lead um, to AV block in patients up to 20% of the time in those who suffer an NMI. Other things that could also cause it are things like medications and valvular disease, but MIs are the ones to look out for. So let's first look at uh, first degree AV blocks. So as many of us probably know, first degree AV block is a prolongation of the PR interval. And the value that's important for this is greater than 200 milliseconds. And we remember that one big box is 200 milliseconds. So if you see that the PR interval is greater than that, you have a first degree AV block. So if we look at this rhythm strip right here and going actually to the third beat, because like we were saying, it's good to always start on a big box whenever we're counting beats. So we see that this lands nicely at the beginning of the PR interval, and it goes one box and almost another half a big box to the beginning of the QRS complex. So this is going to be at least 200 milliseconds plus another 100 milliseconds to the PR interval totaling 300 milliseconds, which is much greater than the 200 millisecond limit for a first degree AV block. This can happen um, in athletes uh, due to kind of their slow conduction, but it can also happen in patients taking medications such as digoxin and amiodarone. Other things to kind of be on the lookout for clinically, if a patient is admitted to the hospital uh, for an infection or for sepsis, this could be the first sign of a perivalvular abscess uh, in patients that have endocarditis. So that's another big one that you can sometimes be tested on um, in boards, but also to see clinically in patients that are admitted for an infection. So next we have secondary AV blocks, and these are the ones that people always get confused about. But if you kind of just approach it by a step-by-step -step process, it's actually really quick and easy to differentiate the two. So... Type 1 AV block is, or sorry, second degree AV block type 1 is wanky block. And that's the progressive prolongation of the PR interval until you have a drop QRS complex. Here what's important is basically those PR intervals and the QRS intervals are irregular. So let's look at an example here. Starting with the second beat, we see that the first PR interval, if we measure that and compare it to the next PR interval, is actually shorter. So the first PR interval is shorter than the next one, and then the second one is shorter than the next one, and basically they're prolonging, prolonging until this fifth beat, you actually have a drop beat. If we did the same thing for the QRS complexes, we would see the same thing, that they aren't at regular intervals. So for second degree AV block Mobitz type 1, the etiologies of this is, again, it can be normal in athletes or people that have high vagal tone, but it can also be due to ischemia because the RCA specifically supplies the SA and the AV node. So if patients have disease in the right coronary artery, they can have a first or a second degree AV block. And structural changes, so let's say patients have, mitral, have had mitral valve repair in the past or replacement, or if they had congenital disorders like Tetralogy of Fallot, and they had that repaired in their youth, that could also cause a second degree type 1 AV block. The main treatment for this is basically stopping any medications that could be contributing to it, treat the ischemia if we know and suspect that ischemia is causing this, and if someone is very symptomatic, you actually do place a pacemaker. However, for testing purposes, second degree type 1 almost never has a pacemaker placed unless the patient is symptomatic. In acute situations in the hospital, if someone is becoming very bradycardic or symptomatic from these symptoms or from this AV block and they're becoming more hypotensive or things like that, you can push atropine to increase their heart rate. So we all know that second degree AV block type 1 is called wanky block, 
but second degree type 2 is actually called hay. And in second degree type 2, we actually have intermittent non-conducted P waves. And this happens because there's a failure below the AB node, so it's in the his Purkinje system. And what's different here compared to second degree type 1 is that you actually have regular PR intervals and regular QRS complexes. And this is important to note because by just knowing this fact that those intervals are the same in type 2 and they're different in type 1 will help you really quickly differentiate the two on an EKG. So looking at this rhythm strip right here, we see that the PR interval in each beat is the same until we have the drop beat. So in this first beat right here, it's the same. Second one, it's the same. Third one, it's the same. And then you have the drop beat. If we measure the QRS complexes, it's the exact same thing again. So this is important to note because this is a quick way to figure out if this is a secondary AV block type one or type two. Just measure the PR intervals, measure the QRS uh, complexes, and then you'll know whether it's a type 1 or a type 2. The etiologies of uh, secondary type 2 are similar to the one, those of type 1. There is ischemia, medications, or structural disease. But the main key thing here is on questions and in real life, you'll have these patients that come in with symptoms. So they will come in complaining that they have dizziness, presyncope, syncope. And the important thing here is that it's something called rate dependent. So the faster their heart is beating, the more symptomatic be they become because that block starts acting up more and more and more. The main treatment is fix the cause. So if it's from ischemia, fix the ischemia. If it's medication, stop the medications. If there's a structural reason, um, see if they need surgery. But most of the time for testing purposes and in real life, these patients will need a pacemaker if they are symptomatic. And finally, we get to third degree AV block. And this is also known as complete heart block because there's no conduction between the atria and the ventricle. So they're basically contracting independently. Whenever we talk about third degree AV block, it's really important to know the intrinsic rates of the heart because those intrinsic rates kind of help you determine where the rate, um, the predominant rate for the patient is coming from. So the SA node or in the atria usually beats around 80 to 100 beats per minute. The AV node, which is also known as the junctional um, rate, beats at around 40 to 60 beats per minute. So whenever you hear junctional rhythm, what that means is the rhythm is coming from the AV or around the AV node. The way I remember that is that the AV sits between the atria and the ventricle at the junction between the two. So that's how you know it's a junctional rhythm. It's coming from the AV. And lastly, the ventricle beats very, very slowly. It beats around 20 to 40 beats per minute. Um, so these patients, if they have a predominant ventricular rhythm, it's very, very slow. Another thing that's important in complete heart block is you can differentiate between um, a junctional and ventricular rhythm based on the QRS complex. So if the QRS complex is narrow, you know that's a junctional rhythm. If it's wide, it's likely a ventricular rhythm because it's coming um, from the ventricles itself, so it's not moving down the his Purkinje, the fast fibers, so it's a slower depolarization, so it's a wider QRS complex. Looking at these two examples, starting off with the top one first, if we measure the P to P intervals, we see that they're kind of beating at their own rate, and they're kind of going at 300, 150, 100, 75 beats per minute, and they're always happening at the same rate, no matter where the QRS complexes are. And if we look at the QRS complexes, they're also kind of going at their rate. So if we start kind of with the second beat, because it ends nicely on a big box, we go 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 40. So it's around 40 beats per minute. And like we said on the prior slide, uh, AV nodes or junctional rhythms go from around 40 to 60 beats per minute and ventricular go around 20 to 40 beats per minute. So it's kind of on that cusp there, so it's kind of hard to know where it's coming from, but because it's a narrow complex, QRS complex, we know it's probably coming from close to the AV node, and it's still traveling down that his Purkinje system, so it's creating a narrow complex QRS. That's in contrast to the rhythm strip on the bottom here, which is wide complex, and it's actually even slower. So first, if we count out the P's, you have them marked here, you see that the P's are kind of beating at their own rate again, in no association with the QRS complex. 
And then the QRS is also kind of beating at its own rate, but it's much slower. So if we start with this first one and we count, we go 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 40, 30. So it's around 30 beats per minute. So it's in that 20 to 40 beats per minute um, range for ventricles and it's wide complex. So you know this is likely a ventricular um, dominant uh, rate. The main etiologies for third degree AV block are similar to second degree and first degree, meaning medications and ischemia. But one thing to also look out for is heart failure. So heart failure can also stretch out um, the muscles or cause fibrosis and that can cause third degree AV block. Almost always, whether it's on tests or in real life, these patients with third degree AV block need a pacemaker placement. If they're acutely coming in with syncope in the hospital, they likely either need a transcutaneous pacer if they're becoming very symptomatic and hypotensive in the moment, or they'll need a transvenous pacemaker before they can get a pacemaker placed permanently. So those are the AV blocks, and now let's talk about QT interval.